morning, everyone. We got a lot to unpack. So if you have your Bibles, 2 Samuel chapter 11, that's where we're going to be in this morning. Uh, we're going to look at two full chapters from the Bible. How many of us believe that God's word is truth? We're going to allow his truth to transform us, to give you some background information about today's passage. Uh, we've been looking at the life of David, and up until this point in Scripture, we've been looking at David as being like the prime example of someone that we should model our lives after. He's been a man of character and integrity, and he's been doing the right thing, and he's been, getting, he's been experiencing victory after victory. And that leads us up into this story that we're going to get into uh, this morning. And... Uh, Another passage of scripture that's not in your notes, but it will be up on screen, it says this. In Proverbs 16, uh, 18, in the message translation, it says this. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. And I think this passage of scripture kind of gives us a premise or sets the scene for the story that we're going to uh, look at this morning. So if you have your Bibles, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Verse 1 says this, in the springtime at the time when uh, kings go off to war, David sent out Joab with his king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. That's a key uh, detail in this story. Verse number 2, one evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. So David's um, palace was literally on the hill. And he could oversee the city, kind of like Pastor Billy's house on the hills of Kalihi. That's why I live on the low plains of Kapolei. I don't want any shenanigans happening in my life. <laughs> so from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she's Bathsheba. Bathsheba taking a bath, the irony. Didn't sh all right, okay. The daughter, Iliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And this is an important time, uh, time stamp that we need to understand here. It's letting us know two important details. One, the, the child that's conceived or is about to be conceived is not the husband's, okay? And the second thing is uh, Bathsheba was actually... Uh, at a time where she's not fertile. And so there are two details that kind of gives us a picture of what's going to happen in this story. Continues on, it says this. Uh, then she went back home, verse 5. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. I want to share a message to us this morning from the premise, how to fall from greatness. Okay, a little different because up until this point, we're talking about how to be great and how God has greatness in all of our lives. And we're going to look at it from a different point of view. How can we fall from the greatness that God has for us? We're going to allow God's word to speak to us. So let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much that your word is truth. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, allow this word to come out in the same way that you put it into my heart. Lord, I pray that this word would set people free, that your truth, Lord, would work in such a way that would bring internal transformation, God, that we'll leave here better than when we came. God, we pray that you would speak to us in a real tangible way to so give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is soft, open, and receptive for everything that you want to deposit into us today. We thank you for your word. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. How to fall from greatness. I grew up in the late 1900s. It's true. How many of us know that we, we are dated now? I'm a 90s kid, and one of the things that marked our generation is that we were known for playing outside. How many of us remember playing outside? I grew up in a time before cell phones, before even video games, we played outside. And how many of us know you can get into a lot of shenanigans outside? No rules for the most part, but there was one rule that many of us know that as kids, when you're playing outside, you needed to be home at a certain time. And there was a landmark that will let you know the time that you needed to be home. Everybody remember that landmark? When the street lights come on. As soon as the street lights come on, you needed to be in the house. If not, you're going to get lickings. And I think lickings is good. How many of us appreciate spanking? All the parents say Amen. I'm an advocate for making spanking great again. Let's do that. Let's make that a mantra. Make spanking great again, all right? Timeout doesn't change any kid. Only spankings does. 
But anyways, uh, on this one particular day, we're hanging out with our friends, hanging out outside. And there's always one kid in the group that always has the most brilliant idea to do something stupid and encourages everybody else to do it. So one of the neighbor's uh, sons uh, actually said, hey, let's ride down the hill on our skateboards. And uh, me, being a little smart at the time, I assessed the situation and I already knew internally this is not a good plan. So I'm trying to tell everybody, I don't know if we should do this, but the guy would just, the loudest sometimes trumps everybody else. He's like, come on, let's do it. And so I'm watching this thing unfold, and I already knew it was a bad plan because, one, the skateboard was super wobbly, and the hill was pretty steep, and I'm just like adding things up. The math don't add up, but everybody else was all for it, and so I sat back and watched the story unfolds. So my brother gets on the skateboard with a friend, and another friend starts pushing them down the hill. And they're going, like flying down the hill. And you know what happens? The speed wobbles start kicking in, right? You know the speed wobbles, right? Speed wobbles start happening, and soon as you, uh, before you know it, boom, they both fly off the skateboard and come to a screeching halt. We run up to them to see what happened. I look and see my brother has road rash all on the side of his leg to the point where you see the white, you know? And I just knew that was not a smart thing. I learned an important lesson that day, to lean into those internal intuitions. I knew this wasn't good. And something inside of me told me, nah, you shouldn't go down that path. And I didn't. My brother did. And I learned an important lesson that has marked my life to this day. How many of us know that God's word gives us a lot of important lessons? God's word is filled with a lot of wisdom. The Bible describes wisdom as a way for us to live our lives. And how many of us know that there are two ways that you can learn wisdom? The first way is a difficult way. You can learn from personal experience. Where you learn the hard way. How many of us have had that lesson? The hard knocks of life teach you some important truths of what not to do. But there's a better way to learn wisdom. And it's through the experiences of other people, that you don't have to go down that route. You can actually learn from other people's lives what not to do and still walk in the path that God has for us. God's word gives us wisdom in two ways. It gives us wisdom to the point where it shows us people on what we should do with our lives. It gives us wisdom on how we should live, but it also gives us wisdom on what not to do. Today, we're going to look at what we shouldn't be doing with our lives. We're going to look at the life of David and learn some important Lessons from the mistake that he made that allowed him to fall from greatness. And one thing that I want us to know as we're looking at how to fall from greatness is this. Here's the truth. No one is immune to sin or temptation. All of us have a bent towards sin. And if we're not careful, we can easily fall into sin. But here's the other truth. All sin starts small. It's usually a combination of Choices after choices that compound over time that lead to big consequences. It's a person that makes a series of decisions that will lead them down a destructive path. And it's the little compromises that lead to big consequences. And so no one intentionally wants to ruin their life. Nobody was like, goes up and wakes up every day, I'm going to ruin my life today. No one ever lives life that way. But we never plan not to ruin our lives. And when you don't plan not to do something, sometimes that lack of planning will lead you down a destructive path. And so I'm not preaching at you. I'm sharing with you. There's an old 90s song that says this, the first cut is the deepest. And I want to let you know that this message cut me first. And I'm going to share it with you because it's a good kind of a cut. How many of us know we can't always be encouraged with the super nice kind of a messages? Sometimes we need the hard truth that will bring transformation into our lives. And so if you lean in and open up your heart, you're going to leave with some lessons that will keep you on the path that God has for you. So how to fall from greatness. If you want to fall from greatness, here's the first thing that you do. Neglect your God-given responsibilities. Neglect your god given responsibilities. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David remained in Jerusalem. This is an important detail because David should have been at war, and we don't know why he wasn't at war, but he ended up staying back. So kings normally will be doing this. They will be going out to war and conquering and so forth. The Bible doesn't give us details on why David stayed back, but it lets us know that he stayed back. And in short, David wasn't where he was supposed to be. 
He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing, and he was neglecting his God-given responsibilities. And here's the truth. All of our lives will drift once we begin to neglect the responsibilities that God has given us. The drift begins subtle once we start to neglect what God has given us as a stewardship for our lives. And most of sin that you and I will face, a lot of it has to do with just environments. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so David started to drift down a path because he lacked productive purpose. He lacked the purpose that God has for him. And I've heard it said this way, if we don't have a productive focus, the enemy will give you a destructive one. So if you don't have something productive to do with your life, the enemy will always present a destructive pathway for us to, cho to choose. I heard the elder say this way, idle hands are the, de the devil's workshop or the devil's playground, which means the devil does his best work when we're being unproductive. So you and I, we need to watch what we do with our time. David should have been on the battlefield, not in the bedroom. So he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And we're living at a time where our modern-day conveniences has also contributed to us having sin available, easily available to us. Uh, the conveniences are great. You can order Uber Eats and have it sent to your house. You don't even have to do anything. They can deliver food right to your doorstep. How many of us appreciate that kind of a convenience? But the downside to convenience is this. Sin is also easily available to you. One app, one text, one thing from your phone can get you going down a path that is destructive. So our conveniences sometimes are the greatest sources of our compromise in our lives. I've heard it said this way, it's uh, too much leisure is never good for our soul. And all, I'm all about refreshing, I'm all about vacations, and we see today everybody's trying to get that revenge travel, trying to get it in. We lost two years in COVID, so let's go Disneyland and Vegas and all these things, and great, yeah, get refreshed, but make sure that you're being purposeful with your time. Because too much leisure is never good for our soul. We need productive purpose. That's why God gives us purpose. And when we neglect the purposes that he has for us, we start to drift away from the life that he has for us. So if you want to ruin your life, start to neglect your God-given responsibilities. Here's the second thing you want to do if you want to fall from greatness. Push away the people closest to you. Verse 1 continues and said this, David sent out Joab, which was his main uh, army official, with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. So these guys helped David get into power, and they were the ones that were fighting alongside of him. Any great person doesn't become great on their own. We always have great people around us that help us get there. And so David had these men that were helping him become great, and he started to subconsciously push them away. We don't know if it was intentional or unintentional, but the people closest to him were pushed away, and it left David in a vulnerable position. He was very isolated, and isolation is never good for any of us. But I want to give a difference between isolation and solitude, because one is beneficial and the other isn't, and they both have to do with how we relate to other people. So solitude on one hand, is refreshing. It's intentional times to get away and seek God in reflection. It's usually actively sought after and is a personal choice for spiritual practice. It's being alone without being lonely. So solitude is when we're getting away with God, allowing our thoughts and our reflection to get us to a point where we begin to pursue him wholeheartedly. This is refreshing for our soul. We need times to do this. Jesus modeled this for us where he would get up early in the morning to get some solitude time with God because he needed that refreshing before the ministry that he was about to do. So solitude is good. Isolation, on the other hand, is not good. It's never replenishing. It's often a reaction to situations and environments that aren't enriching or beneficial. Someone offends you, you go into isolation, or you see something happening that you weren't invited to, so you get FOMO and you get mad and you start going into isolation, and then your thoughts become to be uh, the, the worst of you. How many of us have ever gone into an isolation thought process where our negative thoughts just lead us down into a bunny hole of negativity? And so David... 
isolated himself from other people, and isolation cuts you off from God, from others, and sometimes even yourself. It becomes a prison of negativity. And the, the downside to the pandemic that many of us have, have faced is that people were forced into isolation. That's why mental health is on the rise because you were left with your thoughts and you were left sometimes to deal with these thoughts in a destructive way. And people got, got into a lot of negative situations because of the mental health issues that they got themselves into. So David unintentionally pushed away the people close to him, close to him which left him vulnerable. And we've all seen National Geographic when the lion is on the prowl. How many of us know that the lion doesn't just go after the pack? It's usually watching the pack to see the little Bambi that drifted away from the pack, right? Bambi drifts away, becomes an easy prey. The pack is here. The Bambi's there all alone, and the lion pounces on that prey. Why? Because it was vulnerable. It wasn't around the pack. It left the protection of people. So for us, we need to know that the Bible describes the enemy like this, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So there's a real enemy out there. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And we become easy prey when we drift away from the people closest to us. And that's why David was so vulnerable because the people closest to him who could tell him no was off at war where David should have been himself. And that's why we build our church on small groups, because we need people around us in our lives to hold us accountable. We need people in our lives to tell us no. We can't surround ourselves with yes men and women all the time. My wife tells me no all the time, and I'm thankful for it, because I need the no in my life. How many of us know we need no's? David needed someone to say no in this moment, but the person that would, or the people that would, were pushed away at war. And so if you want to fall from greatness... Isolate yourself from other people, push them away. David didn't sin yet, but he was on a destructive pathway that is going to lead him to the sin. So it was one compromise after another. Third thing that you want to fall to, if you want to fall from greatness is this. Allow pride and power and pride to lead to entitlement. A sense of entitlement is often the beginning of justifying wrong choices and can lead to this thing called a king syndrome. You know what a king syndrome is? As popularity increases, we begin to follow our own set of rules. The real rules apply to everybody else, but we are the exception. I can do what I want. I'm better than anybody else. Don't tell me what to do. And here's the mantra. Do as I say, not as I do. Parents, if you want to mess up your kids, do as I say, not as I do. Live by that. So start modeling for them what they shouldn't do and tell them, don't do that. That'll mess up your kids. But here's what we read. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. That's how much time he had. He literally was able to sleep in all day, not productive. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Here's what we need to do. Pay attention to what gets your attention. You got to pay attention to what gets your attention. David's slip into lust because he looked at something a little too long. So we need to pay attention to what gets our attention. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. These are two important details because they let us know something. Bathsheba's dad was named Eliam, and he was one of David's warriors. Her husband, Uriah, was one of David's 30 mighty men. So bro code, they should be off limits, David. You know these guys. They're your homies. They're your brothers. You shouldn't even be considering this. But pride was the beginning of his downfall and allowed him to feel a sense of entitlement. I don't care who's, who that is. I want that for myself. And the servant was trying to give David a warning, but David avoided accountability. And so David should have been conquering his enemies. Instead, he had that same desire to conquer something. He perverted it from conquering enemies to wanting to conquer this woman. We all have a God-given desire in us that allows us to walk out the passion and the purposes that God has for us. But we can also pervert that to go down a negative pathway. And that's exactly what David did. So verse 2 to 4, it says this. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. All the little compromises compounded up until this moment 
which led to David's downfall. Instead of chasing after God, he was chasing after his desires. That's why we can never be led by our heart. Because sometimes our heart is deceitful, the Bible says. And David made the mistake. And one moment of weakness wrecked David's life. But he probably felt entitled. I'm the king. Don't tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want to do. And I've heard it said this way, authority, power, and wealth do not change a man. They only reveal him. So if you really want to know who you are, get some power, get some authority, get some money, and everything inside of you, the good and the ugly, will come to the surface. You're going to get to see who a person really is once they have authority, power, and wealth. And here's the truth that we can learn from David. Corruption begins when contentment ends. David was king. He had a lot of things, a lot of blessings. Instead of focusing on what we had, what he had in his life, what God has given him generously, he started to focus on what he wanted or what he didn't have. And for us, if you want to go down a slippery path of destructive thinking, start to compare your life with other people. Start to look at what they have and want that for yourself. Start to be envious and jealous of where other people are going with their time and what they're doing with their uh, resources and so forth. And you're going to find yourself slipping into discontentment, which will eventually lead to destructive activities in our lives. So if you want to fall from greatness, allow pride and power to lead to a sense of entitlement. Last thing we learn is this. If you want to fall from greatness, attempt to cover up your mistakes. I say attempt intentionally. Attempt to cover up your mistakes. So Bathsheba, she recognizes that she's pregnant and David uh, sends word to David. David immediately begins to develop a cover-up plan. He goes into, I need to fix this mode. How many of us have ever been there? I got to fix this situation. That's what he's going through. Instead of admitting his mistake and repenting, he attempts to hide the mess. And so he calls Uriah, the husband, off the battlefield with the attempts to get him to sleep with his wife. Here's his reasoning. If he sleeps with her, she'll get pregnant. No one's going to assume anything wrong because that's exactly what happened. No one's going to think anything. And so here's the truth. Cover-ups never cover up. <laughs> cover-ups never fully cover up anything. The problem with David's plan is this. Uriah didn't follow it. You ever had a plan nobody else followed? So David developed a plan. He formulated everything. I just do this, this, and this. Uriah should fall into this. Boom, I'm set free. Uriah doesn't follow the plan. So David brings Uriah, has a conversation with him, talking about, you know, small talk. And he's trying to lure Uriah to go back home and sleep with his wife. And so he says, go home, uh, wash your feet. Uh, and he sends, like, some uh, food from the king's table as a gift uh, and kind of setting the mood, hopefully, that, you know, uh, supper, shower will lead to eventually sex. That's what David wanted to happen. That was his plan. So Uriah goes home, uh, hangs, hangs out with his wife, but he doesn't stay with his wife. He sleeps at, with the other servants. And this frustrated David because Uriah is not following the plan. How many of us know that when you're in sin, you always get frustrated at the integrity of other people? You're like, well, you think you're better than me. You're more holy Really what that's revealing is our sinfulness in our lives, and we're looking at that as saying that I need to be like that, so we start getting mad at the people who are doing the right thing, and that's exactly what David starts to do. So he goes into plan B, all right, maybe I need to get him drunk, so he gets uh, Uriah wasted, hopefully wanting to loosen up his moral convictions. Uriah gets a little drunk and still doesn't go home to sleep with his wife. He had, a mad, he had integrity in his heart, and Uriah the Hittite, that Hittite means that he was a foreigner. And what the Bible is teaching us here is that even a foreigner at this point in the story had more character of God than David, who was the king of the people of God. David should have been doing what Uriah was modeling, but yet his sin was consuming him from the inside out. So David has to resort to a destructive plan. He calls Uriah back, gives Uriah a message for Joab, and he sends him back to war. In that message for the, the, the war general was Uriah's death sentence. In it, David tells Joab to go to the, the most 
difficult part of the battle, and when you're in that heated part of the battle, I want you to put, pull back and allow Uriah to stay there and leave him there to be killed in front of everyone within battle. So Joab, here's this plan. It's a stupid battle plan, a stupid strategy within warfare, but they do it anyway. So the battle is the fiercest. Joab puts Uriah in the middle of that battle. They all pull back, and boom, Uriah dies. But not only does Uriah die, other people die too. Because it's always the innocent that becomes victims to our sin. Our sin is never exclusive to ourselves. It always has a ripple effect to the lives of people. And you know who are the people that are affected? The innocent. And that's exactly what's happening here in this story. So concealed sin always compounds. That's what we're learning here. Concealed sin will always compound. It started with lust. It led to adul adultery. And it ended with murder. It started to get compounded over time. Why? Because David, instead of opening up, was trying to cover up. And his cover up led to more deeper sin. So here's where we pick up the story. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. And this was common practice at that time. When there was a widow who was mourning, oftentimes other men would bring that person in, marry them to care for them and so forth. And so from the public's perspective, this looks like a very noble thing for David to do. He's caring for one of the wives of his soldiers. And so outwardly it looked good, but inwardly God knew. That this is not a good thing. And this is where we pick up the story. It says this. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. David's plan was executed. He thought he was set free. But God saw his heart. Other people thought David was a noble guy. But God saw the real issue. And for you and I, we can fool other people into thinking that we're okay. But we can't fool God. He sees past that. He sees our heart. And the interesting thing about the name Uriah, the name Uriah means this, God is light. And God was about to shine his light in this situation. So four things we learn if you want to ruin your life. <laughs> Neglect your responsibilities, push, push away the people closest to you. Allow pride to get to your head and then try to cover it up. But there's a redemptive part, and this is what we're going to learn in the second part of this story. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, there's redemption. And in every story, there's God's redemption in it. So we set that part to get us to this part. 2 Samuel chapter 12 uh, is where God starts to intervene. So David is the main person in this story, organizing and orchestrating a sinful cover-up. And God intervenes in this moment. God was waiting for David to repent. But David decided to cover up, so God needed to show up. Here's where we read. The Lord sent Nathan to David. David uh, was, uh, the, Nathan was one of the prophets who was speaking on behalf of God. And this prophet, Nathan, devises a brilliant story to get David to confess. Here's the story. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank his cup, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. So the prophet is really trying to set the stage for this confrontation to let David know the, the severity of his actions. And here's what I want you to see. Uh, it says, eat, drink, and sleep. This is what the, the person did with the lamb. And that was everything that David wanted Uriah to do, to cover up his sin. Verse 4, now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. So this rich person selfishly steals the lamb from the poor man, neglecting all the riches that he has. He could have just easily used one of his own. Instead, he uses the poor man's lamb to feed the traveler. Verse 5, this is David's reaction to that. David burned with anger against that man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. Take note of this. He must pay for that land four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. 
you know the truth is this. It's always easier to see the sin in other people than it is to see your own sin. So David was more critical of the other person's sin in the story than his own. And he got mad and he pronounces a four times judgment which should end up becoming his own judgment and consequences for his action later on in the story. Verse 7, David said to, uh, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Caught in his sin, confronted, nowhere to hide, now has to come truth with the reality of the decisions that he made. So there's some lessons that we're going to learn from the, re the road to redemption. Because no matter what kind of mistakes that you made in your life, there's always a road to redemption. The whole gospel is about God redeeming us, bringing redemption to our lives. And so there is another part to the story that God wants to write in our lives. Here's the first thing that we learn on this road to redemption is this. God's grace is available when we repent. It's always readily available when we repent. David had two options, confess or expose. And when it comes to sin, when we're followers of Christ, we have two options, either confess or wait and allow God to expose us. And these are both part of God's grace. Sin separates us from him. And so God wants to be reconnected with us, but because we're in sin, he can't. And so he's waiting for us to confess so that we can have reconnection, but until we confess, there's no reconnection. So he'll wait patiently, but if we wait too long, he's going to expose with the purpose of reconnecting with us, not to shame us, because he desperately longs to be connected with us in our lives, and he can't unless we confess our sins. So he gives us opportunity and after opportunity to come clean. Verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned. So he finally comes to a place of repentance. Then Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. So in this moment, David admitted his sin, admitted his guilt, and recognized that the main person that he offended was God. And anytime we sin, the main person that we offend is God himself. He didn't make excuses. He didn't point blame. He didn't make some sort of plan to try to get himself out of the situation. He just came clean. He admitted his short shortcomings and accepted what was going to come, the consequences. And when he did this, here's what happens. He was immediately met with grace and forgiveness. God forgave him in this moment. And what this forgiveness looked like was this. In the Old Testament law, murderers and adulterers were supposed to be killed. David was supposed to die because of his sin. But here's what he was met with mercy and grace. He, God spared his life and his throne wasn't taken away from him. He was still able to be king. So in that moment, God expressed mercy and grace upon the heart and the life of David. The second thing that we see is this. God reconciles David to himself. The status and the relationship was changed because of David's sin. There was a gap now. And anytime we sin, there's always a gap between us and the person that we offend. What God wanted to do was bridge that gap. And as soon as David repented, God reconciled or changed the status of the relationship and brought unity where there was once division because of sin. So God temporarily forgave David and would ultimately put that burden of sin upon his son Jesus 2,000 years later on the cross dying for our sin. So here's what we see. What made David a man of, after God's own heart wasn't that he was a perfect man. is that in his imperfection, he came clean before God. He admitted his sin. And that's what God is waiting for us. Not that we get it all perfect, but when we make mistakes, because we will, our response to our sin is, should be one of repentance, coming before the feet of God and asking him to forgive us. And when we do that, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So pride ruined David's life, but it was his humility that got him back on the road to redemption. And humility is what God is always after. So the story of David doesn't end with his mistakes. It ends with the grace that he experienced in the midst of his mistake. And when we do so, God will give us that same grace that he extended to David. Second thing we learned here on the road to redemption is this. For forgiven sin still has consequences. David was forgiven, but he still needed to face the consequences. And I want you to read and hear some of the consequences that were severe. The sword 
The sword will never depart from your house. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then it continues on to say this. The son born to you, the one that was conceived in sin, had to die. So remember David pronounced a four times judgment. That judgment was what he reaped as the consequences for his action. Here's what we see. The child that was conceived had to die. The child eventually got sick and died. And it's this innocent that always are a victim of our sins. His son Amnon would rape his half-sister Tamar later on in the story and be killed by his own brother in revenge. So there's death and sword in the household. His son Absalom would sleep with David's wives on the rooftop in front of everybody to see. And uh, later... Uh, he would try to overtake David to become king and be killed by Joab in that attempt to, to take the throne. And the fourth uh, devastation was his son uh, Adonijah would attempt to grab the throne and be killed by another brother. So here's the lesson for us. The sins of the father is always reproduced in the children. You and I, we inherited the sins and the mistakes of the people who've gone before us. And what we pass down to our kids and the kids after us and sometimes the mistakes that we made in our lives. The sins oftentimes are reproduced in the children. So the ripple effect of David's mistake was generational. I want you to know that. That our mistakes aren't always exclusive to us. It has a ripple effect. God wouldn't stop David's promises, but he had to face the consequences of his action. He needed to face some of the penalties. So many of us today, we take sin far too lightly and we're thinking, no, it's just all about God's grace. And we look at the story of David and God doesn't deal lightly with sin. And it should be a reminder for us that we should have a severity or a, 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 a reverence to God in our lives. I remember a, a friend of mine, uh, before he got saved, he was involved with uh, selling drugs and eventually dipped into using, using drugs. And it became a destructive lifestyle uh, where he was just going down a destructive path. And one night, uh, he just was fed up. And he prayed because he had some sort of history with God in his life up until this point. And he prayed God to forgive him but also to set him free from that addiction that he had. And you know how God answered that prayer. You know how God answered that prayer? The next day, the cops busted him. And he was in prison. And he spent some time in prison. But while he was in prison, although he was physically in jail, he was spiritually free. He didn't have the guilt. He didn't have the shame. He didn't have the condemnation of his actions. He was finally free in his heart. And some of us here today, we're physically free, but we're spiritually and emotionally in bondage for some of the things that we've done in our lives. God's not trying to beat you up, but he wants to set you free from that. And sometimes the pathway to being free is repentance, allowing God, coming clean before God and allowing his word to change us from the inside out. So here's the truth for all of us. The consequences of sin doesn't have to be the conclusion to your story. Just because you made a mistake doesn't mean that's the end of your story. God still wants to use our lives, even our mistakes, for his glory. Last thing, as the worship team comes out. God can bring good out of our mistakes. That's the lesson that I want all of us to leave with in our mind. God can bring good out of our mistakes. The story goes on to say David comforted his wife Bathsheba and he went on to, uh, he went to her and made love to her. She be, uh, gave birth to a son and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. So the meaning of the word Solomon is this, peace. And why is that important? Because for the first time in David's life after the sin, he finally felt at peace with God. There was that reconnection. The sin no longer separated him, but he was at one with God. And being at one with God is this peace that God wants us all to experience. And so David was at peace, but God wanted to one-up David. So God sent word to Nathan the prophet to change the name of the son from Solomon to Jedidiah. You know what Jedidiah means? Beloved by God or loved by God. So God wanted to make sure... That David was reminded that even though he made a mistake, that he was still loved by God. That his mistake no longer defined him, but the love of God now defines David. 
And the same thing applies to us in our lives. No matter what you've done, when we come before God and we repent, it's not our sin that's going to define us. It's His love that will be the marking point of our lives. So anytime you feel con condemned or shamed, just remind yourself that you are loved by God. And God wanted David to have that imprinted on his soul. That he will never forget the love that God has for him. We all make mistakes, but we don't have to be defined by our mistakes. By our mistakes. We're defined through what God did through his son Jesus on the cross. That's why in Romans 8.28 it says this, And we know that in all things, say all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I don't care what kind of mess that you got yourself into. God can make a miracle out of that mess. In fact, God does his greatest miracles in the midst of our greatest mistakes. That's the God that we serve. That's the gospel. That all the sin that the world had, God would put that on his son, Jesus Christ. You know where Jesus comes from? The line of David. Because he knew that we couldn't just have a David, as great as David was, we needed a greater David. And I don't want you to think that I want to be like David. No, we are like David. We're going to make mistakes. We need a greater David. We need a better David. So out of the line of David eventually became the greatest David, who conquered the greatest foe, which is the conquering of sin. He not only defeated sin, he didn't even sin himself. And what God did on the cross through Jesus, he took all the sins of the world, past, present, and future, and put that on his son and nailed it to the cross. So when Jesus resurrected, he not only conquered sin, but he also conquered death. And when we put our faith and trust in him, sin no longer has the final say in our lives. We're no longer defined by our sin, but we're defined by our Savior Jesus Christ. So I don't care what you've got yourself into. I don't care what kind of mistakes that you've gotten yourself into. God's not done with your story. If you still have breath, he's not finished with you yet. Your story is at a comma. There's not a period there. So let God continue to write your story and trust him every step of the way. There's no heroes here. The only hero is Jesus. And that's why we need him. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you that this word is so good. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand how amazing you are. That in the midst of our mistakes, God, that you are still loving, you're still gracious, you're still patient with us. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that your grace doesn't only forgive us, but it empowers us to overcome sin. And I pray that you would unleash grace in a real tangible way for us this morning. So that we can walk out and be the men and women that you're calling us to be. So in this moment right now, God, I pray that you would do an inward work in all of our hearts, God. For those of us who have drifted away or maybe have allowed sin to get us down a compromising path, I pray that repentance will be the fruit of today and a restoration, God, to be reconnected back to you and have that peace that David experienced of allowing you to forgive our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.